Hey there, everyone. My name's Chris, and today I am good at Roger Clemens MVP Baseball. This is a game that I played a lot of as a child. Uh, it was the only baseball game that I owned for the NES. Let's see if it holds up. Let's see if I hold up. I'm alone today, so uh, we're just going to go with one player. Uh, exhibition for a single game. And I got to pick my team. I got to... Head over here to the Toronto Bears. And for my opponent, let's do the, the old Canadian rivalry, the Montreal Lumberjacks. These, of course, are... Um, un <laughs> this is an unlicensed game. Uh, the, only, the only license they have for it is uh, Roger Clemens. So the, there is no MLB, PA... Uh, licensing. There's no Major League Baseball licensing, so they can't use any other players' names or uh, or team names or team logos or anything like that. So they they've come up with some uh, some stand-in names uh, for Toronto. We have Locke. This is uh, supposed to be Jimmy Key. Uh, Todd Meyer is Todd Stottlemyer. Uh, Teebs is Dave Steeb. Dells is David Wells. Uh, I don't know who Churbo is supposed to be anymore. Uh, this game was released in like 91, 92, something like that. Uh, so I don't remember everybody. Uh, in the bullpen, Dwayne is uh, Dwayne Ward. Um, Hanks is... Tom Hankey. Uh, not sure who Jacker is, or Milken, or even Willis, but uh, Led Eller is Al Leiter. So I'm going to go with, uh, with Jimmy Key, or Locke. In, in the field, we have Dwight, who's Devon White, uh, Alamo, who's Roberto Alomar, Grub on third base is Kelly Gruber. Cartwell in left field is uh, Joe Carter. Ollie at first base is uh, John Olrude. Uh, Melance uh, designated hitter is... Uh, God, what's his name? Molyneux? I don't remember. I'm... I, I'm sorry to my 1992 Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, catcher Mayer is Greg Myers. Uh, right fielder Martin. Oh. I'm not sure. Um, and then shortstop Lehman is... Um, Oh, I don't remember that either. I feel bad. I haven't, I haven't really had my time to do the the research on on this one because I, uh, I had some things I wanted to talk about, and uh, I just picked a game that I sort of knew inside and out. I thought, but apparently not so much. Uh, Mookers down here is uh, Mookie Wilson, and Prodders is Pat Borders, and. I'm going to put Pat Borders in catching. So I was always a, a Pat Borders fan. And... Let's go with this. Montreal is countering with... Uh, Pedro... Mar it's not Pedro. Yeah, was it Pedro Martinez? Their, their ace? So, this should be fun. D. Delino is supposed to be Delino de Shields. So, um, as I said, I'm playing this game because it's familiar. I don't have to think about it too much. Uh, I'm probably going to get schooled because I actually haven't played it since I was, I don't know, 12 or something like that. Oh, that's not where I meant to throw that. Um, but today is... Uh, I mean, today sure is a day. Today is uh, a month after the uh, Port of Peak shootings here in Nova Scotia. 
and you know, I've had I've had thirty days now to really think about what what that has meant for us here in the province and for me individually. And I, I have to admit, I'm I'm struggling with some of this. So, uh, 30 days ago today, 31 days ago, really, uh, it started overnight. Um, uh, started on the, the 18th of April and continued on until, uh, late morning on the 19th. Uh, a man from, from Halifax. Ah, I thought I had that. So locally here in town. Oh, finally got got somebody. Went on a a shooting spree in a very small, you know, hamlet, inlet, whatever you want to call it, in northern Nova Scotia called Porta Peak. And by the time he was done, he had killed twenty two people and also was shot dead by the police for a total body count of of 23 and uh when they when they finally caught up to him and completely by accident stumbled across him at a gas station he was um uh he was about half an hour away from town half an hour away from my house i was never in any danger i was almost certainly never going to be in any danger i it, it was a sunday morning i don't really get out of the house uh, Sunday mornings or or even Saturday mornings. The fact that it was happening and that it, it happened so close to home really, really, really got me. This is something that, you know, you, you hear about in the news. Uh, you hear about happening in places like New Jersey or or Florida or, you know, places where people actually live. Porta Peak has a population of something like 200 people. And they managed to wipe out like 10% of the town. Conceptually, at the very least, not all of the, the, the victims were from there. And despite the fact that I don't, I'm not aware that I know anybody who was uh, personally affected by this, who lost friends or family. Oh, that's not where I meant to throw it. And that I was never in any personal danger. I've had a ton of feelings about about it all. And I'm really struggling with why. Part of me is wondering if it's not just because, you know, there's a thought that it could have been me. I have traveled along the highway and passed through the... the part of the province where where the shooter was finally found. Or maybe it could have been my friends or my family, and in which case it that, that just feels really selfish to me, you know. I didn't have those concerns when it was when it was taking place in a different country. I didn't didn't have those concerns even when it was taking place in New Brunswick back in uh, two thousand and seven. I think they had the 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 gunman near Moncton, was it? Uh, taking out cops but this one here got to me and part of me feels like that if the other the other shootings didn't then this one shouldn't have either and I don't know it's just sort of been compounded upon and ooh yeah I got him In more recent days, after um, one of the the Snowbirds planes crashed, the Snowbirds are the Canadian version of the uh, Blue Angels. I think they're they're called in the states. Just the the show pilots for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Ugh, I'm really sucking this up, aren't I? And the the person who died was from Halifax. 
Someone I went to grad school with is one of their cousins. Someone I know personally and consider to be, at the very least, someone a friendly acquaintance, if not, if not a friend. Uh, their family has been forever changed by that that event, and as, as much as it pains me uh, to say it, uh, that really didn't hit me very hard at all compared to the the shooting. And I just, I feel very, very selfish about that. And when I say I've been struggling, I, I mean, I've been struggling. It's, it's been very hard. The event, less so than the actual gunman, has been in the back of my mind for the last month now. Oh, I got him. <laughs> that was a decent inning. The event has been in the back of my mind for the past month. Um, just all of the usual questions that you hear. It, it, I mean, it's so stereotypical. It's so cliche. Just talking about, oh, how did how did this happen? How could this happen here? And and I mean, I I for the most part, I know the answers. Uh we're finding out more and more about the shooter and there there are no surprises. He was affluent, he was entitled, he was angry and and selfish and sociopathic. He was a misogynist and a wife beater. It's the very common story of domestic abuse spilling out into the wider public. But yet, it's a sort of reflexively asking, how could this possibly happen here? As if somehow here is special. Somehow we were supposed to be safe. And I mean, I've, I've seen people on the news basically my entire bloody life asking those very questions and every single time I've been like because this kind of shit can happen anywhere normalize violence against women you normalize violence against minorities you know you normalize violence against any group of people and and the people who think that they're entitled to be the so-called normal ones are going to participate in that violence. Not necessarily on an individual level, but uh, on a on a societal level. Oh, that's a home run, I think. No, maybe not. So I mean I I get the theory, I get the the talking points, I get all of that, and I'm still left with a feeling of ah oh, shit, I had that. Of how how did this happen? And I guess my my real question is the real question I'm left with rather is how do oh nice how do I not get this on a, on a visceral level how how does this not just a, of course this could happen here and I I really don't know. And I have to say, for anyone who has lived through something like this uh, happening in in their town or in... Oh, shit, that's a double play. Their local jurisdiction, their, their state or their, their province or their, their lander or, or whatever... It is, I have, I have, I have no right to claim sympathy or empathy or anything like that with anybody. Because again, this didn't happen to me. This happened to other people. This happened to, you know, friends of, friends of neighbors and what have you. This is not my tragedy. It's just a tragedy that happened nearby. But I do 
I do understand the surrealness of the whole thing. I must say, um, where else this has happened, and it has happened in so many places, uh, I do hope the police response was better than what we got here. The RCMP, who operates as the local police in port a uh, could be faulted for their response to everything. Uh, let's just say that it was not it was not great. Um, there are some serious questions that we need to ask of our of our federal police and whether they're even up to the task of operating in uh, as the local police in smaller communities because they they let the people of Porta Peak down and they let a lot of the families <laughs> of the victims down because they honestly bungled the investigation and they bungled the public response to it the the shooter the RCMP, the the Mounties, the Canadian Federal Police, had been made aware of the shooter years ago. That he was um, abusing his partner. Uh, that he had illegal firearms. That, uh, as far as I'm aware, that he had, and this is true, a fake police car. He had built his own replica police car, re replica RCMP oh. cruiser. And uh, they never even bothered to look into him. One of his oh. neighbors had reported him to the RCMP after, oh. after his partner uh, showed up at their house begging for help after he had beaten her and they they wouldn't investigate him they wouldn't look into the claims at all uh she was scared for her life uh, her uh, his partner so she refused to talk to them and unfortunately like many domestic abuse partners she went back Thankfully, unlike many domestic abuse partners, she ended up surviving his murder spree. But she she was exceptionally lucky. But they they had more than fair warning that this man was dangerous, and they just did not take the warning seriously. And then when he finally did go off the rails and start killing people, their response was questionable. Apparently, uh, he and his wife partner, common law spouse, had been at a party in the middle of a, of a pandemic. They were at a house party. Uh, they had gotten into an argument and Ooh, this one might be a home run. This one might be a home run. All right, I'm on the board. They they ended up leaving the party sometime before 10 p.m. And uh, around 10 o'clock, he <laughs> after after arguing with his with his partner and then trying to lock her in uh, lock her in a car. Uh, he went to back to the party and. Uh, burned the house down. Shot everyone and, and burned the house down. But without knowing exactly what the, the argument was about, I can speculate, since I'm just some schlub in my living room, that it might have been about being at a party in the middle of a pandemic. The guy had apparently, according to police reports, been getting increasingly paranoid about the COVID-19 outbreak. And honestly, this party shouldn't have been happening. It was against the law. 
as far as I can tell. We're only allowed to have five people gathered together at any point right now. And it sounds like this party was bigger than that. But also, up until this past weekend, so just a few days ago, uh, we weren't really allowed to be intermingling with other households. Not that any of that's actually important or really relevant to everything that's that, that happened here. Um, so he, he went back. The, the first calls to 911 happened uh, just after 10 p.m. Oh. Oh, all right. It's not Pedro Martinez, it's... Uh, Dennis? Dennis Martinez. That was the Montreal's pitcher's name. Um, but yeah, the, the first calls wow. came in around, around 10 o'clock at night on Saturday the 18th. Uh, it took the RCMP... Uh, about 25 minutes to show up to respond. And that's, you know, uh, I can't really criticize too much um, the response time on this, at least not. Um, it's a small town. No, I, I flubbed that. That was, that was all. There are staffing issues with the RCMP at the moment. So that's not really a... A specific criticism of the response. Shit. There, there's something... Uh, there's structural issues there right now. That's just... Reality of the, of the police force at the moment. But what they, what they did next is, is uh, a significant problem. Uh, they, they showed up... Uh, they showed up at the scene... Oh, shit. Uh, they found a survivor um, who told them that they that the shooter had uh, been driving what looked to be a police car and that he drove off down toward a beach. How many outs are there? That's the first step. Shit. Which the, the police knew to be a dead-end road. Uh, instead of pursuing the lead in that direction, they went to the uh, oh, come on, I had that. Uh, the suspect's house. And found it on fire. And just sort of assumed that he had killed himself. So that, that wasn't exactly, you know, genius policing or anything like that. I mean, obviously they didn't know that he, if he had killed himself. Um, they did take some precautions. And one of the things they did was alert the public on Twitter. Not through any any other official government channels. They they took to Twitter just to say that there was an active shooter situation in Port of Peak and that people should be careful. Aw, hey Daisy. That was my, my bunny Daisy. Now earlier this year, or maybe it was late last year. Uh, the province implemented a, an emergency alert system for on mobile phones, where it just blasts information to to everybody. I don't know if it needs to be province wide or if they can isolate it to different areas, but but that was an option that was available to the RCMP that they chose not to take. They instead just stuck to Twitter. And meanwhile, while they were trying to figure out where this guy was or if he was even still alive, he was out there killing people. People that probably would not have been out going for a walk at 11 o'clock midnight on a Saturday night if they had known that a, uh, um, a mass murderer was on the loose in their neighborhood. And they... When they couldn't confirm that he was dead, they put up a perimeter around the town. This was around, uh, well, I guess we're trading Grand Slams. Uh, this was around 
um, 11 or 11.30 or something like that. They put up a perimeter around the town. Uh, and they stood around all night, waiting to see if he would show himself. Uh, the problem there being he was not in town at the time they set up the perimeter. Uh, he had traveled to a different neighboring town. Oh, I screwed that. Uh, found someone else, uh, uh, an acquaintance, uh, went to an acquaintance's house, killed them, hung out there for the night, and then, and then in, in the morning, uh, moved along. I can't remember if he burned their house down or not. It wasn't until uh, around eight in the morning on Sunday the 19th that they eventually found uh, the killer's, found the killer's uh, partner who had been hiding in the woods all night after escaping the car that she had been locked in, that they realized that he was already gone, that he was driving a fake cop car, that he was dressed as a police officer. That's a, another dinger. They didn't know any of this at that point. So 8 a.m., they now realize that uh, this guy is still on the loose. What do they do? They take to Twitter. Once again, informing residents through a platform that is not universally used that someone is out there murdering people. And more importantly, that they were driving a something that looked like a cop car and was dressed as a police officer. Missed that. This is important information because some of the people he killed, he pulled over on the side of the road using the using the his fake police cruiser and just walked up and shot them after they pulled over for him. It wasn't until uh sometime after 10 a.m. that they had even considered using the emergency notification system. They hadn't they hadn't started drafting the message until uh until after most of his victims were already gone. And they never got around to sending it because before they had completed it, some officers who were <laughs> stopped at a gas station filling up their cruisers recognized him, recognized the shooter, and shot him dead when he reached for a gun. I feel like that's a major part of where my feelings about all this are coming from. It's not just, you know, the that it could have been me, even though I think there is a, a significant portion of that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really deeply sorry for anyone who has lived through something like this, who has lost friends or family members or, or, or who have suffered injuries or whose friends or family or neighbors have suffered injuries. Oh my God. 30 to four. There are there are metaphors that I want to use right now that are just grossly inappropriate considering what I've been talking about. And I'm sorry that I didn't have the same guttural emotional response to those events that I I have had to this one. You know, people will tell me it's natural to feel this more severely because it was literally closer to me, but I don't want that to be true. I really can't help but think that part of it is coming from a place of feeling like the people who were supposed to protect us, the people who were supposed to protect those people, the people of Porta Peak, the people of DeBert and Truro and the places where where this man passed through and killed people in, that their interest and safety has not been put first by the Mounties. That the Mounties were at first most concerned about this being another cop killer, like we saw in Moncton. And so they were looking out for themselves, holding back from actually going in and investigating in case it was a trap for them. And for not telling the public, not yelling it loud and over and over again that there's a dangerous person on the loose and they're actively killing people right now. So stay indoors. Don't answer the door. 
apparently you need to sign up for Twitter to get that privileged information. And in the aftermath of all this, it feels like that what they've actually been trying to protect is their their reputation. And I'm sorry, but over and over and over again, they have stumbled. And over and over and over again, they have refused to really acknowledge that there's a problem and that they need to look at serious changes. The Mounties are a big part of Canadiana. They're our national police force. They're they're humble, brave, and strong, or true, or whatever the saying is. They're supposed to represent something about Canada and what it's supposed to be. And, it, I mean, it's propaganda. I know it's propaganda. But there's still a an eight-year-old inside me that you know, really desperately wants that to be true. And I, I know it's not. I know that historically they're they're a colonial police force, that they were there to to protect the European colonists from from the indigenous people and to more importantly protect the interests and property of those people from the people they were stealing it from. And that, that is the true history and legacy of the RCMP. But that's not the story I was told as a kid. And that's not the story that I want to believe. I don't want to believe in the thin blue line. I don't want to believe in the the all cops are bastards vision of the police force. I don't want to believe in the Mounties as an extension of the state. But they are. They're not there to protect us. They're there to protect their interests and the interests of the state. And they made that incredibly clear. And when I say that, I'm not talking about individual police officers. You know, there are there are good people working for the Mounties and every police force in the country who want to do good but they're part of a system and that system is not egalitarian it is not democratic it is not looking out for the interest of of the whole it is looking out for the interest of the state and and the people who the state is interested in and i'm just really sad about that careful daisy don't get your toes caught. Anyway, um, this was Roger Clemens MVP Baseball on the NES. Um, that <laughs> was a hell of a blowout. Um, congratulations to the Montreal Lumberjacks. And um, thank you for joining me, everyone.